and welcome to this week's episode of Did Shakespeare. I'm Cassidy Cash. One exciting part of Shakespeare's life was the massive amount of exploration that was going on from England to the New World, both under Elizabeth I and under James I. This was a big part of their economy. They wanted to colonize, they wanted to expand England, and they wanted England to extend across the ocean. This wasn't unique to England, of course. If you look at some of the early modern maps that they had, all along the coast was different points of various countries from Europe that were all trying to go over and colonize during this time period. But of course, for the life of William Shakespeare, the main people trying to do it were the English. The word Virginia, named after Queen Elizabeth I, who was known as the Virgin Queen, was a term that applied very broadly to a wide section of what is now known as the Eastern Seaboard. Everything from about North Carolina up through New York State was reasonably considered this vast Virginia that they were exploring. And in December of 1606, there was a group of about 105 explorers who set out under the captain ship of Christopher Newport with this fleet of ships, and they, they went over to try and establish what was known as Jamestown. Now, in 1606, Elizabeth's been dead three years. King James I is on the throne, so Jamestown is being named after James I. But this was a group of people that included Christopher Newport, John Smith, John Radcliffe, George Kendall, John Martin, and a man named Edward Maria Wingfield, who would be appointed the president of this new place. And of course, you'll remember John Smith as being famous in American history as the friend of Pocahontas and part of founding early colonial America. Certainly, he is essential to the founding of Jamestown there would not be a Jamestown without John Smith. But how does this relate to the history of William Shakespeare? Well, with all of this going on, right as Shakespeare was writing plays like The Tempest, this week we're asking the question, did Shakespeare know about Jamestown? <laughs> What I want to share with you is just how essential it was to the life of William Shakespeare to understand exploration and things like the establishment of Jamestown that was going on in his life. This was massive. So the short answer is yes, William Shakespeare knew about Jamestown, but it's hardly that simple. As we mentioned, this was big for both Elizabeth and James. So all throughout William Shakespeare's lifetime, there was a massive focus on colonization. And the explorers that were doing this, both pirates and actual legitimate explorers, the establishment of things like the Virginia Company and the East India Trading Company, all of these companies were coming to royal court to court their investors and say, will you pay for me to go over here and, and colonize this? I want to go and do it. I'm going to take these men. I'm going to take these supplies, but I need to be funded. Will you do that? And it was patrons of William Shakespeare, like the Earl of Southampton and the Earl of Pembroke, who were part of these investors who chose to invest in these companies. So there are direct connections with Shakespeare, even personally, not to mention it being just a huge cultural event that was going on during his life, but even personal connections to him himself for this going on. And right there where he was performing plays was where people returning from these explorations would come to give their reports and to say, here's what happened. And so there's every likelihood that William Shakespeare was hearing from the lips of these explorers tales of what had gone on. But to explore today the history of Jamestown specifically, I want to take you back to 1607 when William Shakespeare was 43 years old, just before the very first recorded performance of The Tempest. When explorers from England set out to establish Jamestown, they landed in present-day Massachusetts on April 26, 1607, this just three days after William Shakespeare's 43rd birthday. They set up what is now known as Jamestown, naming it, as I mentioned, after the King James of England. When they arrived, the area was very marshy and very nasty and it was humid, but so it wasn't very good for health. There, there were a lot of new diseases that were kind of breeding in that area, but they liked it because there was this little nook 
that goes up if you look on the map um, where Jamestown is you go up in this little inlet and Jamestown is right there on the inlet so the water was very deep and very accommodating to their ships and it was also a highly defensible position so they knew that there were Native Americans there some of the Native American tribes were very violent and hostile so if they had to defend themselves this was a good position from which to do that now on June 22nd 1607 Christopher Newport went back to England on the ship the Susan Constant and the Godspeed he went back to report to royal court about what was going on. Before he left, the leaders of the new colony wrote up their very optimistic reports about what was going on, and then Christopher Newport set out to take these reports back to the royal court. So when he got there, he's reporting that everything's going great and we're surviving and it's awesome. But right after he left, this horrible wave of plague and dysentery just beleaguered all of the colonists, and it was all but eradicating the inhabitants of Jamestown. The colonists had not done the work to prepare for the winter and the coming spring. They didn't have an eye on long term. They thought they could just show up there and everything was going to be fine. Remember, there are colonists coming over from England, and England has an established civilization with a lot of infrastructure in place. So when they got here, they weren't trained or ready to be survivalists, to be um, living off of the land. And so they, they didn't build up stores of food and they didn't dig freshwater wells. And at one point there was so much death that there were as few as five people available to bury the dead. As a result, three members of the council, which had been established by the Virginia Company back in England as the governing body for this new colony, Three of the members, which included John Smith, stood up and said their president, Edward Maria Wingfield, was not doing a good job. And so he was put aside according to the rules of the company governance. He was put aside and replaced by John Radcliffe in September of 1607. By the next year, in 1608, Christopher Newport had come back again from England after delivering his positive report. He shows up back in Jamestown with a fresh round of colonists and supplies. But because they had believed the colony to be successful, he was undersupplied for the journey. And they had desperate needs there in Jamestown, and they sort of discovered this when he got there. And when he got there, he came equipped with people who were set up to look for gold. The investors in England who had invested in Jamestown being colonized were promised gold in return for their money to fund the trip over. So when they got off the ship, all of these colonists were focused on finding gold, finding gold. One colonist wrote, quote, there was no talk, no hope, no work, but dig gold, refine gold, load gold. And so John Smith in particular became very, very frustrated with this perspective because they needed shelter, they needed food, they needed basic needs fulfilled, and there was a great negligence of these practical needs. And at some point, the tide shifted in Smith's favor where the colonists themselves started to see Smith's point of view, likely from starvation, but Eventually, Smith replaced Radcliffe as a leader. It's not really clear if Radcliffe stepped down or if he was removed, but Smith became the acting president of Jamestown. When he became president, he ordered that nobody, unless they worked, they would not eat. And this was based on a verse um, from 1 Thessalonians in the Bible, um, the 1 Thessalonians 3.15, John Smith put in a rule that said, he that will not work shall not eat except by sickness he be disabled. So unless you were too sick to work, you had to work, you had to put in these practical things. And it was Smith's discipline and putting rules like this in place that allowed Jamestown to survive. No one died of starvation. There's not one record of a settler dying of starvation while John Smith was in charge. And the colony survived the winter with minimal losses. Now, while this is going on and the changing of the guard into Smith being the president in Jamestown, back in London, the Virginia Company voted to establish a new form of government for the colonists. And instead of having a president, they wanted to have a governor. So they appointed Sir Thomas Gates. And they said, Gates, you're going to be the new governor of Jamestown. And they put him on a ship with a fleet of nine other ships known as the third voyage to colonize Jamestown. And he had hundreds of new colonists with him and they headed out on this famous third voyage to Jamestown. This trip included the ship known as the Sea Venture upon which Thomas Gates was sailing. The fleet got caught in a hurricane and the Sea Venture was separated from the rest of the fleet and crashed off the coast of Bermuda. They would spend several months there rebuilding. There's even a fort that survives still today on Bermuda where you can 
see where they landed and what they invested in there, but they built new ships to take them on to Jamestown later. While the sea venture was wrecked, the other ships carried on to Jamestown, arrived in August, and while they were there, they demanded that John Smith step down. Now keep in mind, Thomas Gates was supposed to replace John Smith when they arrived, but at this point, the remaining fleet members thought that Gates was gone. They didn't know if he was alive, they couldn't communicate with him, there were no radios, and so they knew he got separated, they knew he was gone, but they didn't know what had happened to him. And so they picked a guy, named George Percy, who was supposed to replace Smith. Well, Smith wasn't real keen on stepping down, so he said no, and they worked out a negotiation to where his presidency of Jamestown was supposed to end in September anyway, at the end of September of that year. And so they arrived in August and they said, okay, fine, you can serve out the rest of your presidency, but at the end of September, Percy has to be in charge. Smith agreed and everything was fine. But John Smith ended up not being able to serve the rest of his presidency anyway because he was caught in a mysterious gunpowder accident that was bad enough that he had to return to England in early September of 1609. So George Percy steps in and he's now the colony's leader. Word of this entire tale got back to England and basically captivated the populace there in England. And the story just entranced them. They thought that God had saved the Sea Venture Voyagers and the tale attracted London's leading playwright. Most scholars today believe that the Sea Venture was such a popular ship and carried such high attention because she was the first purpose-built immigration ship. She was built specifically to take colonists to the New World, and she was also the first single-timbered merchantman-built ship in England at all. And when she got caught and crashed, it was widely thought to have been the inspiration for William Shakespeare's play called The Tempest. This scholarship is based on comparisons between the accounts of the wreck with Shakespeare's play. Our friends over at Shakespeare Online, which is Amanda Malabard, runs that site, and she writes that once news of the disaster reached England, there was a lot of excitement because it was in 1610 when all of this got back to England, and these thrilling experiences, these people returned back to England, were telling these amazing stories, and there were at least four first-hand accounts that got published in England in 1610, and it would be the very next year in 1611 when William Shakespeare would publish the first performance of his play, The Tempest, appeared in November of 1611, the year after all of these accounts were there, and there are some striking resemblances between Shakespeare's play and these accounts. For example, the four documents that Shakespeare likely referenced were, the first one is William Strachey's True Repertory. It's the earliest written narrative of the Sea Ventures wreck, and it is written by William Strachey from Janestown to some excellent lady in England. In The Repertory and in The Tempest, Shakespeare seems to quote Strachey by just having Caliban describe birds and berries and streams that are on the island. Amanda Malabard claims that the probability is strong that Shakespeare had access to Strachey's original manuscript, which seems to have been brought to England by Sir Thomas Gates immediately after. Written. Amanda points out as well that Strachey himself was a poet and even lived next door to William Shakespeare. Strachey bought a lodging at the Blackfriars and William Shakespeare purchased a house there in 1613. So that places the account of the Sea Ventures voyage in direct proximity to the barn. The other three are Jordan's Discovery by Sylvester Jordan, A True Declaration, which was published in 1610, and Rich's News from Virginia, also published in 1610, it mentions a set of, quote, butter women's rank to market verses, and there's a ballad that includes that as well. It's these contemporary narratives that are thought to have been the source material for what Shakespeare used to write The Tempest at all. One line in The Tempest I will point out to you that I think is very telling, it comes from Act 1, Scene 2, when Ariel is describing the island and she talks about it as safely in harbor is the king's ship in the deep nook where once thou calledst me up at midnight to fetch dew from the still vexed vermouths. To me this sounds a lot like Jamestown and it sounds a lot like vermouths to me seems like a reference to Bermuda. I will say Amanda Malabard comes to a different conclusion and you can do your own scholarship about what you think. But I think the use of vermouths should suggests Bermuda, 
and especially the kingship being in the deep nook sounds like Jamestown specifically to me. Also, I will mention that while Ariel goes on in this passage to talk about Naples and the Mediterranean, it's worth mentioning that Shakespeare often used the Mediterranean and Italy as a general term for anything that was far away. You have to remember there was a limited understanding about global, spatial, distances and exactly what was across the ocean or how far it was across the ocean. You see this in explorations like John Smith tried to find the Pacific Ocean from Jamestown and was thwarted because they had no concept of exactly how far it was all the way to the west coast across what is now the United States. So they didn't really understand how far away things are and the Mediterranean could simply be Shakespeare's way of talking about something that was far away. So Yes, Shakespeare, along with everyone in England, were closely following the exploits of Jamestown and the colonists, and their adventures across the ocean were significant occurrences in the life of the Bard, making The Tempest even more fun to read when you know what it's based upon. That's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. If you like this channel and you like Shakespeare history, please hit like and subscribe. And don't forget to join us for Shakespeare Weekly every Monday. I send out links to extra history. And being a subscriber to Shakespeare Weekly, you get first dibs on the artwork that I create. These are maps, diagrams, and eBooks all about Shakespeare's history. And the subscribers to Shakespeare Weekly get them first. So if you would like to learn more about that, check the links below in today's show notes. That's also a great place to start if you want to explore the history further and make your own conclusions about Shakespeare and The Tempest. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.